geez, Nick, you're like, you're really a really buzzkill <laughs> with that <laughs> presentation. But what I like about it, though, is that it gives us, I think, some tractability to start to think about where might we go when it comes to solutions. Now to give us some perspectives around how some of these challenges are playing out in the energy sector, I'd like to invite uh, Dale Bugin and Lisa DeMarco uh, to the stage. They'll each be giving a brief, um, brief set of remarks on their experiences, and then we'll move into a moderated discussion. All right, there we go. Well, thanks, Monica, for having me, and thanks for the great remarks, Nick. That sets the stage nicely. So I, I guess I want to chat a little bit about the experience that we've had at Canada's Ecofiscal Commission because I think it fits very nicely into the story that, that uh, Nick just told you. So Ecofiscal is primarily a panel of economists, of high profile economists from all across the country who collectively agree that good policy can make sense for the environment and for the economy. And in practice that has led us to policies that put a price on pollution and put a price on things like carbon dioxide emissions. And in some ways, those commissioners are the quintessential evidence people, the people that want one more fact and one more piece of data and, and are sure that if we can communicate that one more piece of data to the world, then everything will be fine. Fortunately, perhaps, at the same time, my commission also has a group of advisors, and the advisors are maybe a little bit of the symbol side of the story. And those advisors are people like former prime ministers and former premiers, former mayors from all sides of the political spectrum, from heads of oil and gas companies, from heads of NGOs for the environment. And the story there, the symbol there, is that all of these different perspectives can be on the same page. They can all agree. They can all support that strong evidence base provided by those economists. Now, for a while, I, I think we made great progress. We started about five years ago, and it felt like we were turning a corner, like carbon pricing was becoming mainstream and crossing those party lines at last and becoming a story driven by evidence and not by, by something else. And we saw a change in the world. We saw in Alberta implementing carbon pricing policies. We saw uh, conservative premiers in, in Manitoba and a leader of the opposition in Ontario all promoting carbon pricing. Now there was still debate. There was still debate about how to do carbon pricing, whether you should use the revenue you generate to invest in clean technologies as Ontario and Quebec have done in their cap and trade systems, or whether that revenue should instead be used to cut existing taxes. Now that was a good debate. That was a useful debate in which the evidence wasn't crystal clear. There was only one way to do it. And that was a constructive debate across those party lines. It didn't last. Now we did some polling and we've been doing some polling over, over the years and we saw awareness of carbon pricing increasing and with it, we saw strong supporters of carbon pricing increasing as well over time. But we also str saw strong opposition increasing over time as well. In fact, we started to see some of that polarization happen. The more we were talking about carbon pricing, the more polarizing the narrative was becoming. So why exactly is carbon pricing so polarizing? Or, or maybe it isn't, but it has appeared to be polarizing. Part of it's about climate change as a, cha uh, as a challenge. Uh, costs that are maybe in the future rather than now, and costs that are elsewhere rather than here. That's a, a barrier in itself. But it's also about the policy solution itself. That word taxes, carbon taxes, has a certain resonance for the, the, the audience that, that is hard to avoid. And in fact, all the things that economists so much like about carbon pricing, that that price is visible and transparent, and that it's not picking a specific winner, is exactly what a broad population finds challenging about carbon pricing. It's visible and it's obvious, it's a tax, it's one more cost. And you can't paint a, pit, a clear picture of the destination because we don't know exactly what how, and how the market will respond to those prices. So interesting tension there. Uh, but the, the other thing that I think that's made this conversation hard is the pervasiveness of myths and misinformation around carbon pricing. And I think that the myths around carbon pricing that markets don't work or carbon pricing won't affect behavior or carbon pricing will undermine the, the competitiveness of our industry or carbon pricing is inherently unfair for income households, those are, are, are not true. 
they are myths and misinformation. Well-designed policies can overcome those, those challenges and it can do it well. But the answers to those myths are much longer and less bite-sized than the myths themselves. And that makes for an interesting asymmetry that's made our conversation, I think, increasingly hard. It's been easy to seize on those myths and misinformation as powerful talking points. So where does that leave us? Well, it, at Ecofiscal, we are continuing to try to push evidence into the conversation and continuing to try to have a better conversation about carbon pricing and about pollution pricing and about policy that makes sense for the environment. And that's meant trying to engage a broader audience in our work. It's meant trying to correct the record in the media when some of those, those misperceptions become prominent and, and repeated too freely. Uh, but I will, will acknowledge that it, that it is a challenge. It does feel like an uphill battle. And at times, uh, uh, I feel some of the pessimism that, that Nick ended with there as well, that, that it's, it's, uh, it's hard to engage that, that broad audience that is not necessarily the that, uh, that Ecofiscal has to offer.